Welcome and thanks for your interest in this talk. My name is Florian Hartig. This is joint work with my co-author Magdalena Meyer. Uh, we're both based at the University of Regensburg and if you have feedback, you can tweet to us uh, via the Twitter handles that you can see below. The motivation for our work is nicely captured in this cartoon by PhD Comics where an early career researcher is learning the hard way that the only good results are significant results. And this lesson is unfortunate because often in negative and non-significant results is important information, but many researchers are uncertain about how to um, properly communicate and statistically evaluate a non-significant result. And this is what I want to talk about. To give you an example of this in practice, uh, this was a study on the efficacy of wildlife warning reflectors that are currently installed additionally uh, to the normal reflector posts in many European countries. So these reflectors, they cost a lot of money and the theory which is put forward by the producers of these reflectors is that when the light of the car falls on the reflectors, those create a so-called light fence that prevents wildlife and in particular deer from running uh, onto the street when there is an upcoming car. We, and by this I mainly mean the lead author Falco Brieger conducted an enclosure experiment where we found no significant effect of reflector presence on the deer behavior. And this was supported by an observational study where we again found no significant effect of reflector presence on the deer behavior. So our suspicion was that these reflectors do not work. This is also supported by physiological considerations. Uh, nevertheless, the statistical question is, does the fact that all these effects are non-significant really convincingly demonstrate that these reflectors have no effect? Another example where you want to show no effect is pesticide risk assessment. So you and other international regulations require that you demonstrate that pesticides in the concentration that you use them will have no effects on non-target organisms. So what is done in practice is that people conduct different experiments at different pesticides concentrations and then they determine the concentration at which the pesticide treatment and the control are statistically indistinguishable. We reviewed this concept in this uh, review which uh, came out recently. What I wanted to show you with these examples is that there are many situations in science and ecology where it would be useful to be able to demonstrate the absence of an effect. So for the wildlife reflectors it's just that it's a priori unclear or controversial whether an effect exists or not. Uh, but it would be, either way, it would be useful to show that it's there or not. And I would argue that this is actually the standard situation of science. In the situation two with the pesticide regulation, the analysis goal is a priori to demonstrate that an effect is absent. So we're unidirectionally interested in showing that there is no effect. Either way, the problem is that the framework of p-values and null hypothesis significance testing, which is the basis of most uh, analysis, is asymmetrically optimized to demonstrate effects. And so researchers are often in a situation that they're not really sure about how now to interpret non-significant effects. And this is what I will explain to you in a little bit more detail. Why is it so difficult to interpret non-significant results? Remember that in hypothesis tests you can make two types of errors, type 1 and type 2 error. Type 1 error rates, so the rate of false positives, are controlled. So if you have a significance level of 5%, you know that you make exactly 5% type 1 error. Type 2 errors, or 1 minus type 2 error is the power, however, is not controlled. So in general, you don't know how much type 2 error you're doing. And because of that, we have an asymmetric treatment of significant and non-significant results. If an experiment returns a significant p-value, you say, well, I know that there is only a 5% chance um, to get a significant result if there is no effect there. So it's reasonable to assume that there is an effect. If an re experiment returns a non-significant p-value, however, 
the results are usually treated as inconclusive because we don't know the type 2 error rate and therefore we're not sure how much evidence this is in favor of the null hypothesis. Therefore, arguably, but I think it's pretty clear that this is the case, the current practice in most sciences, including ecology, is that you concentrate on the significant results uh, or the significant predictors and ignore the rest. And in the worst case, you even publish only the result if it's significant. And the result of this is that it limits which questions we dare to ask in the first place. We design studies to find significance and not uh, to show that there is no effect. And it also limits which conclusions we dare to draw from data. And there has been abundant literature on the problems that this is causing uh, downstream. So if you know that you can only publish significant results, it leads to selective reporting in the literature, but it also leads to modification of the hypothesis uh, to make results significant and to practices such as p-hacking, the fact size hacking. So what options do we have to address the problem that significance tests put asymmetric attention towards finding effects? We of course not the first ones to think about this and the most popular response in the literature has probably been to say we shouldn't address the problem, we should change the question. So specifically what has been suggested is that rather than trying to find out whether there's an effect or not, we should concentrate on how big the effect is and what our uncertainty is. So concentrate on effect sizes and confidence intervals and if we only discuss this we don't have the problem of deciding between a zero and non-zero effect and all this problem goes away. So in principle we agree with these arguments and we would say if it's possible you should concentrate on effect sizes and then we can forget about the whole problem and we don't have to speak about this any further. That being said we think there are many situations where this is not really possible. So in some cases we would really like to show that there is a zero effect or that there is the absence of an effect. For example, in the case of the pesticides, we're even legally required to show that there is no effect and it will probably be pretty hard to make the statistical argument to the legislators uh, to change the laws uh, because of the statistical reasons um, that effect sizes are better uh, uh, to calculate. Also, I think the advice to concentrate on effect sizes and confidence intervals disregards to some degree the social reality of the typical PhD student that is trying to get out a paper in the existing hypothesis testing framework and uh, for whom just move to the effects and not discussing significant anymore is not really a viable alternative. We therefore think it is important to also provide solutions that work inside the standard yes-no testing framework and there are candidates around. A classical candidate is the so-called post hoc power analysis. For a non-significant result you calculate either the minimal detectable effect, so that is the effect that you could have detected with the chosen power, or you can calculate the minimal a minimum detectable difference, this is the effect size that would have been significant in your non-significant experiment. An alternative for this, which is proposed by us, is that you just look at the range of the confidence interval. So you're looking uh, at the what is basically the highest possible value or the strongest possible effect that is still inside your confidence interval. And then for all these three uh, so all these three methods give you basically an effect and you can put thresholds on this method and this is done to then decide whether you accept the non-significant result as, as a true null or whether you do not trust the non-significant result. Additional alternatives to this are the so-called equivalence test where you test for an interval. So there usually you test uh, for the true effect to be in an interval uh, around zero or a Bayesian alternative would be the base factor where you quantify the relative evidence of an effect versus no effect. 
In Maya et al. 2020, you can see the reference below, we used extensive computer simulations to compare the first three methods, the MDD, the MDE and the confidence intervals. And what we were interested in is to find out whether they have skill in deciding between a true negative result and a false negative result. And we quantified this by the false trust and the false um, mistrust rate in the non-significant results. And I should say the relevance of this is that currently in pesticide um, risk assessment, the regulatory guidelines say that you should calculate the MDD and this is the basis for um, pesticide risk assessment. So what we could show in this paper that there is a clear conclusion if you look at the false trust and mistrust rate, then um, the, uh, the, the selection by the confidence intervals is clearly superior to the MDE and the MDD uh, criteria, which are both uh, examples of the post hoc power analysis. So the clear conclusion of our paper was don't use a post hoc power analysis to interpret non-significant results. And we can understand why these results come about. Imagine you have two experiments A and B and this is their effect size estimates and confidence intervals. And so you see they have the same uncertainty, so they have the same variance, so their power is the same. So the post hoc and power analysis would assign the same evidence for the null to these two experiments. But it, this doesn't really make sense and this is part of what Hönig and Heise 2001 call the power approach paradox. Our confidence interval solution here is faring better because for the confidence interval B is further away from zero. So option B we would say larger effects are possible. We, so we would assign this less evidence for the null. And so basically this is the reason why the confidence interval is preferable as a cutoff filter to accept the null hypothesis. So in the paper we also published a protocol um, about how to use this in practice. What about uh, the additional alternatives, so equivalence tests or base factor? So we also compared this, this is unpublished material. The base factor has very similar error rates than a confidence-based acceptance and equivalence tests are slightly worse but this could be because the null hypothesis of an equivalence test is different. You're not testing their zero or non-zero, you're testing whether the effect is in a certain interval. And so it's a slight, it's a little bit comparing apples and oranges in this case. From that, we conclude that if you want to make a statistical effect, no effect decision, ideally you would use the base factor. Because the base factor measures what you actually want to know, the probability of a zero effect. It's technically well understood and it performed very well in our simulations. If you don't want to go Bayesian and you prefer to stay within a null hypothesis significance testing framework, the main result from the Maya et al. 2020 paper is do not use post hoc power analysis. Use acceptance criteria based on confidence intervals Instead, we describe how you could use them and they produce far better error rates than the post hoc power analysis. The only disadvantage is that um, those confidence intervals or this method doesn't have a clear probabilistic interpretation so you don't get a p-value. There's no clear theory about how to choose the cutoffs. So if you think that this is a big advantage, one alternative might be equivalence tests. They don't test exactly if there's an effect, no effect. They try to reject that the effect is large. So they show that the, uh, they show that the effect is in a certain interval, which you usually choose around zero. But for this, then you get um, a p-value. And so you can show that the effect is small. And also this might be an advantage over just saying it's non-significant. And finally, apart from the practical advice, I hope I've also drawn your attention to this problem of the asymmetry of hypothesis tests, the possible solutions, but also the potential costs for the scientific system and the scientific discovery process if we use methods that are asymmetrically directed towards one particular outcome, in this case, 
towards finding effects. With this, I would like to thank you and I'm looking forward to your questions, although I have no idea how we're going to ask them.